and gonna go go ahead and open the room now. Hi, everybody watching on YouTube. Evening, good morning. What time is it for you, Alex? Uh, one in the morning. Oh my goodness, <laughs> that's true dedication to Jewish arts. Well, I love you guys, and I learn, and I hope you know this information we could uh, exchange. It's mm -hmm. always good, absolutely, indeed. I'm looking forward to seeing um, our mutual friend, Mark, in May. Max. Oh, Max Stern. Oh, good. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, he, that's wonderful. I'm so glad you're doing that program. Me too. Hi, everybody just coming in. Hello, everyone. It's Laurie again. I saw him this, this, this afternoon, this evening. I was going to say, you and I, uh, by the end of this, it'll be like three hours, four hours spent together today. <laughs> yeah, I'll see, I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, Mark, I'll go ahead and pin you and we can get started. All right, wonderful. I'll mute. There we go. Good evening and welcome to our program. How do you say Bravo in Yiddish Italian opera? for the Yiddish speaking masses in early 20th century America. I'm Mark Kligman, the director of the Lowell Milken Center for Music of American Jewish Experience. And we thank you for joining us today. This is part two of a five part series, very unique series, and we're so glad that you're with us. This event is made possible by the Lowell Milken Center for Music of American Jewish Experience, and we will post in the chat, a link to our other upcoming events. We hope you can join us. And we're located at the UCLA Herb Alpert School of Music. And we also have generous support for this program from the David Victor Foundation. We also want to provide our thanks to our co-sponsors, YIVO, the California Institute for Yiddish Culture and Language, the UCLA Alan D. Levy Center for Jewish Studies, the Jewish Music Forum, the DIVIC project at the University of Haifa that has received funding from the European Research Council, Council, excuse me, the ERC, under the European Union's Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Program, as well as the International Forum for Jewish Music Studies. We're so glad that we have all these wonderful partnerships. Our presenter for this series, who I will introduce, is Dr. Daniela Smolev Levy and we all enjoyed the first presentation that she did. She received her doctorate in musicology from Stanford University, has a master's degree in piano performance from New York University, and a bachelor's degree in comparative literature and music from Princeton University. She currently is working on a number of projects, including what you heard about the DIVIC project. We're so looking forward to hearing more, so without further ado, Dr. Daniela Smolov-Levy, welcome. Thank you so much, Mark. I'm so pleased to be here and thank you all for coming. I'm so glad to have an opportunity to share this research with you all this evening. So I will share my screen so you can see my PowerPoint presentation. Is everyone able to see it now? Great. So this evening I'm gonna be talking about Oscar Hammerstein I. You might all be more familiar with his grandson, Oscar Hammerstein II, of the duo of Rogers and Hammerstein. Uh, but it is the case that the Oscar Hammerstein I was probably as famous in his own day as his grandson is in ours. So previously on How to Say Bravo in Yiddish, we saw this 1907 cartoon that poked fun at New York elite's obsession with the social aspects of opera going and how their talking and noise and social display interfered with the enjoyment of the true opera lovers, you can, as you can see here, who are sitting in the uppermost parts of the opera house, in the balcony, in the upper levels, in, in the standing room at the back, 
And among them, you can see many immigrants who were known at the time for being avid lovers of opera, despite being of quite low socioeconomic status. And so what people like Iron Abramson, whom I talked about in the last lecture, were trying to do was to find a place, a setting where non-elites like these immigrants, among whom there were many Yiddish speaking Jews, a place where these people could feel welcome, feel like they belonged. And so Hammerstein did a similar thing to what Abramson was doing. So Abramson, you can see, um, brought the opera to the people. He took popular price opera, really quality singers, good performances, and brought it to the Lower East Side in the Lower East Side theaters where his target audience lived and worked. Hammerstein took the opera and, sorry, took the people and brought them uptown to the opera. So this contrast between the downtown public and the uptown opera is what we're looking at this evening. Um, so Hammerstein was in a similar democratizing mold as I was just saying to Ivan Abramson. And he liked to promote himself as, as he told the New York World in 1906, the quote, little man who'll provide grand, provide grand opera for the masses. And he was very much an anti-elite figure. But the funny thing about Hammerstein is that although he really wanted to provide as broad access to opera as possible, his big success in 1906 with the Manhattan, Manhattan Opera House actually ended up being an elite institution that rivaled the Met. So um, his involvement in the opera scene is a negotiation between these elite and non-elite spheres in public and in operatic performance style. So my goal here is to talk about how um, Hammerstein targeted and appealed to these Yiddish speaking audiences. People have written about Hammerstein's presence in the mainstream opera world, but no one has looked at his tremendous cultural presence in the Lower East Side cultural sphere. So my goal is to look at three parts of this question of Hammerstein's presence. One, we'll look at what he did and how it appealed to Yiddish speakers. We'll look at how the Yiddish press characterized and responded to his activity. And we'll look at, to the extent we can tell, what the performances were like and what the audience response was. So I thought we'd start just by looking briefly at Hammerstein himself because his own identity was integral to his appeal to Yiddish speaking audiences. Hammerstein was an incredibly fascinating figure. He was persistent and tireless, undeterred by failure. For the better part of 40 years, he tried to put on opera of any kind that he could. All he desperately wanted to do was to do opera, sort of bewildered his contemporaries, but this is what he wanted to do. The press often talked about how he'd been bitten by the opera fly. Uh, but he began with, uh, in, a humble, in a humble state. He immigrated to New York City as a teenager. He actually ran away from home. He was born in, to a Jewish family in Germany. And he started out in the cigar business, just working on, as he put it, the cigar maker's bench. And he gradually worked his way up through the system. He invented uh, some innovations to cigar making, and he made a tremendous amount of money. And all that money he used to his pursue his great passion, which was opera. But there was sort of a paradox, as I said, um, in his opera affairs. So even though he really wanted uh, to, um, to do popular opera, he ended up doing elite style opera. But he ended up sort of being the most democratic opera impresario possible because he ended up accepting elites, even though he didn't really want them <laughs> into his opera house and provided a truly democratic experience of opera for all. So we'll focus today on the last part of Hammerstein's career, looking at the, what he called educational opera season in the late summer, early fall of 1909, which he offered at popular prices. We'll talk about those in a minute, as well as the opening of the subsequent regular season in November. So how did Hammerstein's activity appeal to the Yiddish speaking public? Well, with the educational season, it was tailor-made to appeal to these audiences. In the first place, he offered them this, these performances at popular prices, as you can see here, ranging from 50 cents to $2, which was totally standard prices for popular price opera at the time, the same thing that Abramson charged. These were prices comparable to what people were paying on the Lower East Side for the very popular Yiddish theater productions 
So it's definitely affordable to anybody who wanted to go see the opera. And so this educational season was essentially a preliminary season to his regular season, where he offered all the, you know, many of the same operas that he performed in his regular season with many of the same singers. It was at the Manhattan Opera House, which is a grand, grand building on 34th Street and 8th Avenue, which was at that point considered uptown. <laughs> Not so much in this day, you know, in this time, but at that time, that was uptown in contrast to the Lower East Side, which was downtown. And he had all the same, you know, sets and costumes and all the grandness of his elite style opera, but he was offering it at popular prices. And the Yiddish press report, reported frequently on the fact that these performances were at these low prices. So it's obviously an important feature, as we saw in the presentation I gave about Abramson. Um, not surprisingly, I mean, opera is expensive. So making it affordable makes it just that much more appealing. He also targeted the Yiddish speaking public, as you can see here, by advertising in the Yiddish press, which the Metropolitan Opera certainly did not do. And he also ran, as you can see here, ads for his regular season, not just the popular price season, which suggests that he thought that the Yiddish speaking public might attend at the regular prices, which they were known for doing, um, but in the most, you know, the higher, highest uh, level seats. So they were least expensive, but they still still did want to go. And part of Hammerstein's goal with the educational season was to encourage people by giving them familiarity with his opera house and with the high quality of his opera offerings to encourage them to come to this regular season. So that's what that's what these ads are, are for. As to the repertoire, that was another way in which he appealed to these audiences. You can see here the operas on offer are standard popular Italian and French fare for the most part. It's the same pieces that Ivan Abramson and similar companies were, were doing and that uh, Yiddish speakers were known for enjoying and patronizing. But he also included, as you can see here, some works that were not so common among popular price performances, especially some French operas, as well as operas on, a Jewish, on Jewish subjects or with Jewish composers. And that was also a really important part of his appeal to Yiddish speakers. You can see here an ad for Halevis La Juive, which was both Jewish and subject and had a Jewish composer. You can see here in the ad that it's advertised not only with the transliterated English word for La Juive, I'm not sure why, <laughs> it says, uh, but um, also with the Russian Yiddish name of the opera, Zhidovka, which would have been more familiar to Yiddish speaking audiences at the time. In fact, he not only performed operas that had these Jewish elements, but he actually opened the educational season with Le Prophet by Meyerbeer, who was of course a Jewish composer, and um, as well as an opera that wasn't performed all that often. So he kind of combined the elements of novelty and of the Jewish element to appeal to Jewish audiences. Not only that, for the opening of the regular season, he staged an opera that had a Jewish subject, which was Masne's Erodiad, which was being given at the Manhattan Opera House in its American premiere. So that was also a big splash. But again, the subject matter was clearly of interest to Jews because the press talked a lot about the Jewish elements of the opera. They talked about the recitation of the Shema, of the Jewish prayer in the opera, mentioned how it was a biblical opera. There was even a special note in the ad for it in November 19, 1909, describing the opera as, quote, an opera that interests every Jew. So this Jewish connection was also clearly very important um, in, in his promotions of, of the opera. Uh, so I thought we might listen to a little bit of Erodiad, sung by one of Hammerstein's biggest stars, Mary Garden, in his regular season. And this is uh, Salome's aria from um, Erodiad.
another way that, oh, sorry. Another way that Hammerstein appealed to the Yiddish speaking public was, as I mentioned earlier, through the simple fact of his own Jewishness. But in addition to that, he made special efforts to cultivate connections with Yiddish speaking circles. Uh, one example of this is, as you can see here on the front page, no less, of Die Wahrheit, which admittedly was a culture focused newspaper, but still did big front page news on the right hand side here. You can see how they were reporting how Hammerstein rented his opera house for free for the memorial benefit for the eminent Yiddish theater playwright, Jacob Gordon, who had just died. And so the uh, Jewish actors and the theater community were putting on this special performance to raise money for Gordon's wife and 11 children. So Hammerstein was a kind of a benefactor. And this was obviously very important. This is written about in, in many of the Yiddish newspapers at the time. Hammerstein was also connected to Yiddish speaking circles through his endorsement of the Yiddish theater actor Boris Tomaszewski's new theater focused newspaper, Die Yiddische Biene, which came out in mid November 1909, just after Hammerstein had opened his regular season. And you can see here in the middle um, his photo featured prominently, and he was one of several prominent people, Jewish people in. Uh, the theater world who wrote congratulatory letters that were printed in the newspaper to Tomaszewski on the founding, the establishment of this paper. And uh, what's important here is how he makes uh, very clear to the readers that he appreciates and is aware of their patronage of the opera. He refers to them as truly integral to the opera scenes. You can see here he writes, the Jews are very important of the Manhattan Opera House, and although they take mostly the uppermost seats, still their applause is more appropriate than that of those who listen below in the $5 seats. In truth, the success of a grand opera performance is very much dependent on the particular masses of people whom you are targeting with your newspaper. In that article, he also talks about the importance of the improvement of taste, which he characterized Tomaszewski as doing by establishing this, this cultural newspaper. And um, this was an integral part of Hammerstein's own ideology of cultural uplift. He believed that opera, as he put here, is in the awakening of the soul to the sublime and the divine. He talks about how opera makes for better citizenship. It lifts people out of the sordid affairs of life, kind of enlightens them, brings them to a higher plane of being which fit very much with the broader ideology present in American society at the time of cultural uplift that applied to not just opera, but other forms of quote unquote, high culture or fine, fine art. And this in turn had resonance with some of the ideologies present in the Yiddish speaking cultural circles, especially socialist ones regarding ideas of Bildung, education, or Euskleram, which meant enlightenment. And this was a part of a general current among Yiddish speaking intellectual circles where they believe that Yiddish speaking public should be exposed to the best quote unquote of world culture, mainly meant European culture in their view at this time, uh, translated either into Yiddish or in the original languages um, in order to just broaden people's horizons. So Hammerstein's prominently expressed ideas of how opera could fulfill this kind of personal enlightenment for people fit right in with this, um, ideology in, in Jewish immigrant circles. And the Jews, in fact, were well known for taking advantage of these other cultural uplift opportunities being made available by progressive era reformers at the time. There were lots of free lectures held by the Board of Education, and the Jews were known for attending a lot of these. So another aspect of Hammerstein's appeal to Yiddish speaking audiences, and frankly, anybody who was interested in opera was the stars. Everyone loved to hear about the stars. The newspapers in both the Yiddish press and the English press, they loved to report on the stars. There are constantly articles about you know, which singers were on which ship and who was singing and whose opera and who was moving where and who was fighting with whom. So there was lots of intrigue and scandal and court battles. It was made for great, great press coverage. And Hammerstein knew this and so he exploited this part of opera production as much as he could. One lucky hire for Hammerstein for the educational season was this Spanish tenor you see here, Federico Carasa, whose name fortuitously was very much like Enrico Caruso's, Caruso being probably the most famous opera singer um, at the time he was singing at the Metropolitan. And in English, it's confusing enough. 
they're two letters different, but in Yiddish is even only one letter <laughs> different in the spellings of those names. So it seems likely that Hammerstein was perhaps hoping that people might get confused as to you know, who was actually singing in his opera house. So this all just generated a lot of coverage and the press was clearly aware of the confusion between the names. This is all, all good. There's no such thing as bad publicity for Oscar Hammerstein. Hammerstein also appealed to Yiddish speaking audiences by including some singers in his season that were familiar to some Yiddish speakers from the other popular price opera that was going on at the time. Um, Abramson's company had already folded by this point, but there was another Italian grand opera company performing at the Academy of Music, which was you know, a little bit farther uptown than typical Lower East Side theaters, but still very much part of the Yiddish theater sphere. And there were lots of Yiddish theater performances that were held there. So this is a familiar venue to them. And they had a singer named Nicola Zarola, whom you can see here, who was famous for holding one particular note in Aida for a very, very, very long time. We don't seem to have a recording of this long note, but it, everyone talked about it. it. was He was the Aida long note tenor. And when Hammerstein heard about this, he said he, he had to have Zarola for himself. So he somehow managed to quote unquote steal him. There's often references in the press to kidnapping singers between the Metropolitan, the Manhattan Opera and the Italian Opera Company. So he somehow managed to get him, but there was all kinds of scandal over that because there was some legal issues. He was still under contract, so he couldn't sing with Hammerstein. I don't know, it was complicated, <laughs> but uh, people followed this press coverage apparently. So we'll hear him singing a little bit from Aida, not that long note, but uh, a little bit of, of what he sounded like. Sorry. Uh oh, where'd it go? I apologize. that Hammerstein found of appealing to Yiddish speakers was by blending the elite and the popular spheres. So we talked a little bit about how he was offering his elite opera house with all the elite trappings, including some singers uh, whom perform, who performed in both the educational season and the regular season, regular price season. He also made opera for Yiddish speakers seem accessible by making his opera house um, available to them. So even though he had yielded to the elites early on in 1906-07 in putting in box seats 
because there were some who were so disillusioned with the Metropolitan that they insisted on having the box seats at the Manhattan. So he, he agreed to do that. But for the educational season, he actually took out the box seats and replaced them with single seats, which downplayed the social aspect of opera going and made it seem like a more democratic kind of experience. So just because we have these recordings, um, I thought we'd just hear a little bit of another singer, Marguerite Silva, who was a Belgian soprano and she had a quite an illustrious European career. She uh, performed in the educational season and stayed over into the regular season as well. So Yiddish speakers who went to the educational season really did have a taste of some of the big stars who were in the regular season as well. now move to the second part of, of this presentation and think about how the Yiddish press responded to Hammerstein. We saw ads, of course, already, but there were lots of reviews of, of the performances and lots of reporting on Hammerstein's activities, as long, along with all kinds of other opera news at the time. Hammerstein made, as I mentioned before, for great copy. He was uh, always providing sensational, scandalous stories. He seemed to always be involved in some kind of uh, court battles. But in addition to that, the Yiddish press very much emphasized his Jewishness and the, his Jewishness and the co-ethnic connection he had with Yiddish speakers. And they portrayed him as this bold, unflappable, upstart Jewish fighter who was fighting against the big, bad, aristocratic Met with its backward artistic ways. So he really was kind of this revolutionary figure that fit nicely into the revolutionary socialist ideology of a lot of the readership of these Lower East Side newspapers. And as I mentioned, you know, the press is, was generally interested in any kind of Jewish connections uh, with opera. Uh, there's a funny note here uh, in a review about how Hammerstein actually and the other Italian popular press company that was performing at the time, they changed their operas that were supposed to be performed on Rosh Hashanah on the Jewish High Holy Days because they realized that the singers in the chorus, many of whom were Jews, according to the press, 75%. Who knows if that's true, but there were a lot of Jews performing in the opera and they needed to be able to also sing in synagogue. So Hammerstein supposedly changed the opera so that the, the singers could finish, uh, finish singing in the opera and then hurry off and make it in time for services. And the morning journal was noting how these singers remembered that their names were not Yanini and Naftalini, but Yankel and Naftali and they needed to go to synagogue. It was a bit of a play on the fact that singers of all uh, ethnicities and, and uh, nationalities change their names to sound more Italian uh, for their opera singers because that made them seem more authentic. So the Jews are no exception to this. And the press also made explicit their awareness that he was in fact Jewish. I love this, how he says, you know, can't leave out mention of our old acquaintance, the King of Opera, Oscar Hammerstein, who's also very clearly no boy. <laughs> and uh, he was, uh, someone who was, as I said, fighting against the big mad Met and how it was a place for multimillionaires just to show off their, their wealth and their diamonds and so on. And um, this, these kinds of articles about Hammerstein were very much emphasizing his uh, rags to riches story. He was uh, the, how, from the smoke and dust of the tobacco shop appeared a Jewish cigar maker. So he came up out of this you know, immigrant um, culture to make it into the big time. So 
presumably Yiddish speakers might be able to identify with someone who came from an immigrant background like them and had made it into this massively glamorous and exciting world of opera. And Oscar Hammerstein was able to give the matter a run for its money, that longstanding um, sort of bastion of, of elitism and, and social display. Uh, that's the smoke and dust quotation there. You can see how Hammerstein stole away the Met's monopoly on being the best um, opera house the world could offer. And they actually even referred to Hammerstein in the Jewish Daily News as the Napoleon of Melodies. Uh, and they were also aware that Hammerstein um, attracted more Jews to his opera house than the millionaire opera house on Broadway, that's the Met, because he found ways of appealing to Jews knowing that, as he says, knows well that the Friends of Music in New York are Jews and also staging operas with what he referred to as Oriental melodies. So choosing operas that had some kind of aesthetic um, appeal or familiarity to Jewish audiences. So I wanna to move to this third portion of the presentation and talk about what the performances um, were actually like and how the press, um, also how the press, you know, referred to uh, to some of these um, these performances, how they reviewed them. And you can see here the um, Varheit again putting on the first page the review of the opening night of the educational season, which was frequently highlighted. As you can see here, um, I'll use my mouse here. You can see um, the opening of the opera, and then here they have transliterated educational. So this was clearly emphasizing that this was, you know, this had this ideological bent to it. Uh, so we put it on the first page and this stands in contrast to the coverage in English language newspapers like the New York Times and the New York Sun and the New York Tribune, which did also cover um, Hammerstein's educational season, but they didn't put it on the front page. They put it um, in the, with the other culture news. But the fact that this is on the front page of the Yiddish press shows the relative importance of something like this to Yiddish speaking audiences. The press also gave Hammerstein a lot of credit for contributing to this um, development of New York's, New York's opera scene in these years in the late, you know, from 1906 or so to 1910. The article here talks about how there are, uh, there are five operas in New York going on. Hammerstein accounts for two of them, plus his educational season. The Met was doing its own season uh, as well as another um, set of performances at the New Theater. So there was just so much going on in the press. Uh, as I said, you know, gave, giving Hammerstein credit for, uh, for contributing to this musical development. And talks about how New York will hardly be so unmusical as one thinks in Europe. And no European city has yet had such an opera season as New York will have this winter. So we can look a little bit at what the performances were actually like as, as best as we can tell and what the audience response was. So the reviews were generally quite positive. Uh, New York newspapers were notorious for being extremely criti critical sorry, of even the elite opera. And you can look up reviews of the best, you know, most illustrious singers singing at the Met at the time. And you know, they're complaining bitterly about how she, you know, the soprano didn't hold her notes properly or she, you know, the acting was no good. There was, the criticism was normal uh, part of this um, review, uh, review scene, I guess you could say, in the press. Uh, but in spite of that, the reviews were good. Um, typically, the press talked about how they were usually, the performances were better than what was typical for popular price opera at the time. And how it was almost as good as the real thing, quote unquote, which is what Hammerstein presumably was aiming to do with the educational season, at least. Um, as to attendance, you know, this is always what we would love to know as historians. There are no records, as far as I know, of actual box office attendance at the Manhattan anyway. Uh, the New York Sun at least reported that 150,000 people had attended the educational season. Who knows if that's true? The Forward, uh, one of the main Yiddish dailies at the time, reported that in mid-October the house had been packed for the first few days, but then attendance fell off some. So we don't really know where the truth actually lies, but um, Hammerstein did know, though, going into this, that he was going to lose money. He actually, long before the season even began, he talked about how the educational season in particular was going to be a philanthropic endeavor. He was going to 
provide the public with this best quality opera, even if it meant that he was going to have to lose money. And he talked about how he was expecting to lose $75,000 in the season, how he only lost 50,000. So in his view, that was a success. But part of what was going on here was not just that there were, you know, that maybe there were problems with the popular price season or that, um, you know, maybe people didn't, didn't like the repertoire or something. Um, there was just too much opera going on at the time. There was a, a New York based voice teacher named Herman Klein who wrote a book in 1909 called Unmusical New York, which was the kind of tongue in cheek since there was so much culture and music and opera going on at the time. He talked about how there could be up to 18 performances of opera in a single week. So that would mean on average, you could go to three different opera performances a day. And that clearly is a level that was not sustainable in any context, I don't think, um, even for a place like, like New York. He talked about how American people have gone opera mad. Um, this opera craze term was thrown around in the press an awful lot. Um, and cheap opera in particular was everywhere. There's a famous New York music critic, William Henderson, who wrote a lot about opera, reviewed performances at the Met and, and everywhere, including Hammerstein's. And he also went to the, a lot of the popular price performances and reviewed them. And he talked, he wrote two different articles about educational cheap opera and, and cheap opera enterprises. So clearly this popular price opera scene was, was very much on people's minds and very prominent. And you can see here in the ad, um, here on the slide, how the uh, Manhattan Opera House's educational season was printed side by side with the ad for the Academy of Music performances of popular price opera. That was the company that had Zarola. And the competition was so great that the Italian company actually lowered their top price to $1.50 to try to compete with Hammerstein. But there was just too much and they actually had to fold um, early, much earlier than expected um, because there was just so much opera. As I mentioned, you know, the Met also doing their much expanded uh, set of offerings as well. And of course, as I mentioned before, you know, Hammerstein made his big splash in the opera world by becoming this true competitor to the Met with his Manhattan Opera. No one had really managed to make a dent in their, in their monopoly until him. And in their attempts to outdo one another, both the Manhattan Opera and the Metropolitan Opera were spreading themselves extremely thin. They were putting on way more opera than they could afford to do way more opera than people were willing to attend. Um, and part of what was going on in this opera war was that behind the scenes, Hammerstein and the Met, which was headed at the time by the Jewish banker Otto Kahn, they'd entered into the secret talks, which were um, not known until much, much later. So this is really, nobody knew about it at the time um, to arrange a buyout of Hammerstein. So he would agree to not produce opera in New York for 10 years in exchange for some sum of money. And so to increase his worth as much as possible, Hammerstein was putting on as much opera as he possibly could. And part of that expansion of his empire included the educational season, along with performances in Chicago, in Philadelphia, in Boston. He even announced a plan to create a nationwide chain of opera houses, which didn't materialize. But the point was he was trying to do as much as possible. The educational season was, was one of those things. And ultimately they did agree to deal for one and a quarter million dollars that Hammerstein took, because uh, both it was no good for either party <laughs> to be doing that much opera and losing so much money. So um, he took the deal, he went to London to wait out the decade. Um, he tried to do some opera there, nothing really stuck, and he actually ended up dying in 1919, 10, or just one year before the, the um, ban would have ended. But what's interesting about Hammerstein is that despite his sensationalism and his flair for showmanship, um, a lot of his contemporaries really respected him tremendously. Um, and even the director of the Met recalled of him that it must be said that he did make genuine and unavailing attempts to democratize opera. So he had this real reputation for this being this idealistic impresario who just was never, never, never giving up. So we should probably ask, you know, why is Hammerstein important? You know, what is, what is his legacy? So I've touched on a couple of those points. I mean, he showed that the Met um, did not have a monopoly on the opera world, but he also did an unusual thing in that he was able to bridge the elite in the popular spheres in a way that didn't tarnish the elite side of the sphere's prestige. He was able to create this popular democratic seeming environment that still had 
cultural prestige and was able to attract elites, but also that seemed accessible and appealing to non-elites. And there's just so many ways that Hammerstein's uh, activities appealed to Yiddish speakers. We've talked about the cheap prices, how he advertised um, the Yiddish press, how he included popular repertoire, especially Jewish related things. He cultivated connections with Yiddish speaking circles. He emphasized the ideology of uplift. He used singers that people would have known about as well as um, you know, stars uh, when, when he was doing his regular, his regular season and also having some of the same people perform in both the educational and the regular season. So how he downplayed the social aspects of opera going, how he promoted his reputation, or at least he was, he was perceived as this reputation, perceived as a fighter who was fighting the good fight for the common man against, against the elites. And maybe most importantly, he himself was an appealing figure as an immigrant Jew who had worked his way up and been incredibly, incredibly successful and who had, who was trying to bring as many people into the operatic fold as possible. So as I mentioned at the beginning, we can sort of see Abramson and Hammerstein as maybe two sides of the same coin, whereas Abramson was bringing um, the opera downtown to the people, Hammerstein was bringing the people uptown to the opera. And we saw how the press embraced him and his Jewishness. Um, and through this Jewishness, Hammerstein was able to connect Yiddish speaking audiences to this big time glamorous opera world and make them feel integrated and make them feel like they belonged, that they didn't have to just be marginalized outsiders who were grudgingly being admitted to elite precincts, that they mattered that their cultural preferences, their social preferences should be addressed and could be addressed even in, an, in many ways, elite seeming sphere. So the funny thing also about Hammerstein is that, you know, as much as he wanted to bring his audiences to his uptown opera house, uh, the press uh, talked about maybe bringing Hammerstein downtown to the Yiddish theaters. There's a September 1909 article in Die Wahrheit where the writer uh, wondered whether Hammerstein had seen any of the Yiddish theater plays, such as The Jewish Heart, The Jewish Soul, or The Spark of Jewish, Jewishness, Das Pintelied, which was a huge hit at the time, very popular Yiddish theater play. And the article ends by musing about whether Hammerstein could best be described as the Jewish heart, or the Jewish soul, or the spark of Jewishness. So really seeing Hammerstein's essence as this uh, Jewish person who was building connections for this Yiddish speaking uh, cultural circle. And you, know, you might say that, well, maybe Hammerstein's approach was self-serving and that he was trying to attract as many people to his opera house as possible. Um, but it is still the case that he, one of the ways in which he did so was by showing Jews that, um, that they mattered, that they could belong in the opera house. And in these ways, Hammerstein brought these elite and popular spheres together and he was able to eliminate a lot of the snobbishness of elite opera um, and make it accessible while still retaining its allure and its prestige. Thank you very much. So thank you, uh, Daniela. That was really, really wonderful. Um, there's a growing um, list of questions in the chat. And um, maybe we can ask people, if you don't mind, to uh, ask their questions uh, to you. Or if they want, they, we could keep them in chat. But if anyone would like to raise their hand, we are happy to recognize you to ask the questions you put in the chat. Yeah, uh, so Alex. Hi, very, very fascinating. Um, Thank you, Daniela. It opened uh, another aspect to my knowledge, uh, but I'm slightly confused, not from what you said, but from the, um, because I'm not that familiar with certain aspects. I understand the Yiddish theatre, Second Avenue, the Tomaszewskis and the Adlers, et cetera, et cetera. And I also know that the elite of the non-Jewish world also visited the Yiddish theatres and when Broadway was uh, fairly empty and people weren't going, they were still packing in the stars at the Yiddish theatre. So I was wondering why 
Yiddish theatre that in, on Second Avenue didn't attempt to do opera or am I wrong? And what was the um, basic reason with Hammerstein? Because Hammerstein wasn't a religious Jew, completely assimilated. The audience he was appealing to were probably not religious at all, but they spoke Yiddish because it came from the high, from, from Poland and Russia and various other countries. So that was the only connection, I presume, between them. And his ultimate aim was to get money and pack them in and, and make, and, uh, make a, a living, at least, or a base living. Um, am I correct? And, um, you know, can you elaborate on those things, please? Sure. So, um, you know, the Giddish Theatre was a sort of a musical theatre setting, kind of analogous to what we would consider maybe Broadway. So it was spoken dialogue um, with lots of music, uh, there were numbers, uh, solo numbers and, and ensembles and choral numbers and so on. There was an orchestra. Um, so that's what was really big in the, you know, Second Avenue, you know, and all the uh, Bowery theaters as well. Um, I've been standing here for like 10 minutes. That's Freedom. what- I've been oh, standing here for like 10 minutes. <laughs> um, so I think part of the reason that the Yiddish theater mostly didn't do some do opera, though they did a little bit of it, was that there was already so much available. So there was, I mean, there was the, there was the Manhattan Opera House, there was the Metropolitan, but also, as I talked about last time, there was Ivan Abramson, there were countless other um, popular price opera enterprises in um, Italian, in, there, there were German ones, there were lots of in English as well. So that part of the cultural scene, I guess you could say, was already pretty, pretty well established. So it wasn't really to the Yiddish theater's advantage to do opera because they had their own really popular musical theater already. So they did try, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about this actually in the next talk about how one of the major popular Yiddish uh, playwrights uh, at the time, Moisha Horvitz, did put on a season of Italian and French opera, but in Yiddish translation. So really trying to appeal to Yiddish speakers on the Lower East Side. Um, and that was sort of a short-lived affair. There was um, a production of Parsifal, in 1904 as well on, in Tomaszewski's People's Theater. But by and large, I think just the comparative advantage for the Yiddish theater was not to do opera because there was so much else going on. Um, you know, and as to Hammerstein's you know, secular Jewishness, I mean, absolutely, you know, he was not religious as you were saying, and nor were most of the people who were reading these newspapers. So, but I think that given how much coverage the press was giving to the Jewish elements of the composers of the subject matter, of um, identifying Hammerstein repeatedly as a Jew um, suggests that that co-ethnic connection was important as a cultural connection, even if it wasn't necessarily religiously based. Um, I hope that answers your question. If you want yeah, to use it. And a quick, a quick one. Um, Charlie Appin, um, great singer, was um, best mates with Al Jolson and they used to collaborate and sing together and watch each other's shows. Were there any influences there within the opera and the uh, the vaudeville world or the world of uh, um, showbiz in that sense? Because they used to support each other and sing together and get drunk together and do all sorts of things together. So yeah, yeah, there were a lot of overlaps, and again, something actually I'll talk about a lot more in the next lecture when I'll talk about Mikhail Medvedev, who was a a Russian opera singer, a Jewish opera singer who came had a major career in Russia and then came over to um, the United States and had, you know, had sort of a couple of a couple of tours. And he also performed in the Yiddish theater as well, a little bit. Um, and he came over to the US uh, through Tomaszewski, who was looking for ways to spice up his offerings. The Yiddish theater was incredibly competitive. And so all these theater producers were constantly trying to find ways of standing out and getting more audience members to, to come to their particular theater. So one of Tomaszewski's ways of adding interest was to bring Medvedev over um, to perform at the People's Theater. And so he did that some, and he also did these uh, operas as well, excerpts from operas and also entire ones. So there was that overlap uh, for sure. I don't believe that there were many opera singers um, at like the Manhattan, for example, or the Metropolitan who were also singing in the uh, Yiddish theater, but 
I, I mean, I could be wrong about that. I haven't come across any references, but certainly um, there was a lot of, um, there were a lot of connections as you were pointing out between the, uh, between the, the opera world and the Yiddish theater. And also actually there were, there's a lot of Italian opera sounding music in some of the most popular Yiddish theater as well. So, but that, that's for another day. So thank you. So yep. I'd like to go to uh, Bonnie or Basia. Yes, hi. So um, I live in Philadelphia and we also have a Met that was designed by uh, Oscar Hammerstein. And it, in the last few years, it's been renovated. I haven't been to a performance there, but I understand it's absolutely exquisite. Uh, you know, back to the, the original. Do you have any, any idea if um, uh, opera or the, or the Jewish audience, which there's, you know, a large Jewish population in Philadelphia, and there certainly was at that time, um, if they were doing the same thing uh, as far as attracting uh, Jews to the to the the opera house, and I don't know how long it was an opera house here in Philly because it did become all sorts of other things uh, along the way. But I'm wondering if you had any idea. That's a great question. I have not yet explored the Yiddish press in Philadelphia, but Hammerstein certainly did um, expand his uh, operatic empire to there. I mean, he built he built that opera house, and he. Um, yeah. spent a lot of time courting the Philadelphia elites to subscribe and actually he called them out at some point um, because they weren't yeah. subscribing enough and he he said you know I've, I've built this opera house I'm putting on this opera you're not even subscribing if you don't subscribe I'm gonna I'm gonna back out and they responded they did end up subscribing so uh, was that in New York or Philadelphia it was in you... Philadelphia in Philadelphia oh yeah. that's great. Yeah, uh, but that was to the Philadelphia elites. Um, yeah. I don't know how much he made special appeal. Yeah, there, but that yeah. would be something certainly. Yeah, to look and Tomaszewski, Tomaszewski and his wife also had a theater here, actually right practically in the neighborhood where I live. Um, there was a, a heavy, a heavily populated Jewish quarter, and um, they performed, and so there could have been that kind of collaboration. So if you yeah. come across anything during this series that we're in touch, um, I, I would love to know. Uh, my brother is a tour guide. And so the reason I know a little bit more because I just took uh, a mural arts tour uh, of Broad, Broad Street, which is where, where the opera house is. And so I learned about uh, a little bit about the history there. And I think, I think it was, it may still be the largest opera house in the world. So it, it's huge. <laughs> That's so, fascinating. Yeah, thanks yeah. for sharing. I'll let you know if I come across anything. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. All right, thank you. Um, we have a number of questions in the chat. Um, maybe I'll just read some of them off, try to get to as many as we can. Judy Pinolis writes, you mentioned how Hammerstein democratized opera uh, district from the elitist nature of the opera, but opera in the 19th century in America was not considered elitist but popular music. Can you elaborate how Heimerstein was bringing something new rather than continuing more along the lines of the previous 40 years of say traveling opera troops in the US? Absolutely, that's a great question. For the vast majority of the 19th century from 1825 when, it, when Italian opera first came over um, to, to the United States, um, opera was popular entertainment in the sense that we understand it of appealing to mass audiences, and it was not considered highbrow or elite. Over the course of the 19th century, a division increasingly developed between foreign language opera, which usually meant Italian, and English language opera. And elites at different times tried to, unsuccessfully, to appropriate foreign language opera, which was mostly at that time touring Italian troops who were coming over to the US and, and traveling around and then going back to Europe trying to appropriate this foreign language opera as a place for um, elite social gatherings. Um, but, you know, there, there was still a general kind of shared uh, popular culture at that time without real divisions between elite and popular culture. As the 19th century went on towards the 1880s and 1890s, the division did increasingly become more stark between foreign language opera sung by big name stars, usually from Europe, um, and the more middle-class oriented opera, usually in English translation, people like Henry Savage, 
who toured around. There are lots of lots and lots of these English language groups. Emma Abbott, Emma Yuke. There are so many of these guys. And opera did continue to have this popular presence for sure, and these popular price companies that, as you say, you know, toured all over the country and in places both big and small. Some really surprising places you find out that opera was performed in the 19th century. Um, but by 1900 or so, institutions like like the Met or a little bit earlier, you know, the Academy of Music had kind of emerged as these places for elites to, to gather and where they could hear the absolute best opera, the, the biggest stars and the biggest themes and um, had the best, um, just the most expensive performances, most, most elaborate spectacles. And so even as this was happening, there still continued this popular price scene as, as, as you can see, but this rhetoric of making accessible something that was elite had certainly solidified by this time. And so that's why people like Ivan Abramson and Hammerstein too were, could talk about um, opera for the people that was distinct from what was being given at places like the Metropolitan. And we saw in that, as I mentioned, the 1907 cartoon where the standard reputation was that opera, the, the most um, expensive opera was in places like the Metropolitan where it was a place for elites to display their wealth and their diamonds and so on. And there was all the rest of this public that did want to hear the opera, but that really couldn't because they were being pushed out because of this elitist element. So both, both things were going on at the same time, but the popular price scene was a response to this um, increased elitism, even though opera continued to be integrated into the popular culture, as you can see in a lot of Tin Pan Alley songs um, at the time as well. So I hope that answers your question. It's not a clear cut division, but there are sort of, you know, predominating reputations um, that, that did develop around this turn of the century period. So we'll try to do a couple more questions before we uh, in, in the evening. Um, there are a number of questions uh, that, are, that are kind of surfacing around the relationship between Oscar Hammerstein, Hammerstein the first and the second. Hey, do you want to speak to that uh, a little bit? Because obviously everyone knows. <laughs> I wish I could, I don't actually know. <laughs> I, I don't know how much. Um, well, he died in 1919, so you know, I'm not sure when Oscar Hammerstein II was born. Um, but uh, so he was born in 1895. Someone put in. Okay, so he may well have known him, but I, I don't know. That would be that's something interesting to learn about. I, I bet somebody has has written about that. Yeah, yeah I'm sure it's a well well covered. Um, so I have just two connected questions. Um, one is that. Um, it seems around this time period from the late 19th, early 20th century, a lot of um, uh, successful Jews in New York also became art dealers and they had a lot of the similar type of um, uh, interests to try and make art available either by buying art and showing it in exhibits or in, um, in their own galleries or to really be dealers to really sell art. And I'm just curious if you've looked at any of, of that work. And the other question is, I'm just wondering how unique this experience is of what Oscar Hammerstein is doing in, uh, in um, America. And was there anything like this going on in Europe? Um, so to the first part of your question, um, I haven't done much research on other um, sort of art uh, aspects of the of the cultural world, but it doesn't surprise me. I mean, the many of the um, of the people involved in the Progressive Era um, settlement houses and reform efforts were Jews, and their goal was to promote uh, education in general and especially knowledge about different forms of culture um, to the widest possible audience. So. Um, it would seem that that would fit well into this broader mindset of um, of making these things um, broadly available. So that that's something that, that would be interesting to look into the overlaps in these um, sort of cultural spheres among those who were um, patrons and, and promoters of of the arts. Um, and as to the European scene, you know, it's it's a really interesting um, situation where America is in so many ways trying to. Um, imitate Europe um, to prove its cultural sophistication. We saw those reference to, references to, quote, unmusical New York. Americans had this reputation for being sort of boorish and backward, whereas in Europe, there were so many people who were, um, even from modest means, who would, who would go to a lot of these local 
opera companies that that did exist there. So there was very much um, a popularly oriented scene there as well. But even so, there were still um, elite elements for sure. Um, in London, for example, there was a lot of um, you know a lot of talk about you know the making the opera available wasn't just a place for aristocrats. So that kind of um, democratic rhetoric and dialogue was certainly going on there, but it is the case that um, opera was probably more widely popularly patronized in Europe uh, than it was in America. And I think a lot of democratizers in the US were looking to Europe as an example of, of this sort of broader civic interest in high culture. Great, thank you so much. Um, I guess before we close, one last comment or question from Alex. I uh, was just trying to answer your question about Europe, um, if mm -hmm. I can, uh, London, the East End of London. Um, opera was important to the Yiddish speakers at the time, the turn of the century, and a little bit later on, where some of the uh, theatres uh, were five or 6,000 people would turn up to hear either a, a great world cantor or an opera star which was actually frowned upon by the orthodox society at the time who um, tried to forbid their um, Jewish people to actually come. They tried to um, excommunicate them and said it was a, a sacrilege and you shouldn't do this sort of thing. And um, these singers were not allowed to perform. And there was also Russian during the time of the Tsars and uh, before the revolutions, there was uh, Russian opera singers who used to perform, um, and also at the 10th century, would record under Russian labels and uh, Russian recording labels, and they would perform for the for the elite in that society. So, yes, it was quite popular in Europe. America tried, did copy it, and um, you know they put on a different version, which wasn't quite as good as because the people that the the elite people in Europe were the patronages of these operas where in America they tried to get it more towards the people as opposed to the wealthy. I hope that helps you. Thank you, thank you. Any final comments, Daniela? No, I don't think so. I'm just uh, glad to see there's interest uh, in understanding this incredibly vibrant immigrant opera scene. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, another great presentation. And the third presentation will be in March. I think it's March 8th, as I recall, is that correct? Yeah. And uh, we hope we invite everyone to join us back at that time to continue our conversation. Again, a really big thanks